the story doesn't have an ending, we said during our times for all ages. I wonder if we can think a new one up together. Stories we tell about who we are and where we came from and how we all relate together and what is the most important. These stories matter. I want to talk a little bit today about old stories and new stories and why it matters. But first, I want to tell you my favorite Charles Darwin story as an introduction to a new kind of story about life that he helped us to tell. So, Charles Darwin, from a very young age, had a hobby of collecting and classifying living things. And he became a rather a good amateur naturalist in the process of practicing his hobby. And in particular, as a young student at Christ College at Cambridge, he got taken up with the popular craze of the day for collecting beetles. You don't think as a parent that your kid is going to go off to college and get mixed up in entomology, but it happens. It happens. So one day Charles was out on the quad busy not doing his homework and he happened to spy an unfamiliar species of beetle, like climbing on a tree. And excited by his find, he stopped to gather it in his right hand, whereupon he noticed there was a regular caravan of beetles going up and down the trunk. So he grabbed another specimen in his left hand, and then having run out of useful appendages, but with more beetles still within easy reach, he did what any coleopterologist, any beetle guy worth his salt would do. He put the beetles in his mouth for safekeeping so he could gather some more. Whereupon the beetles, much aggrieved and aggressed upon, sprayed a noxious blast of chemicals from their hind legs directly onto his tongue. So, from Charles Darwin, we learn two important things. All life on Earth arose from a common ancestor through a continuously unfolding natural process that took place over billions of years, and very important, when securing beetles with your mouth for safekeeping, be sure to place them between the lips butt side facing out. <laughs> right, if you remember one thing from this sermon. So you might not think so from this anecdote, but Charles Darwin was one of the greatest geniuses who ever lived. And one of the greatest scientists who ever lived. The influence of Darwin's work on later scientific study is really incalculable. He is the foundation from which all life sciences and natural historians begin outside of the sciences. His ideas shook the pillars of Western civilization, challenged old worn out notions of philosophy and religion. He revolutionized our understanding of what it means to be human and what our place in the web of life is. And we are still 214 years later working out the implications of his discoveries. And yet Darwin is a, a different kind of genius than what we usually think of. He's not the picture that we have of an unparalleled intellect having this kind of sudden eureka moment, right? And then all these great ideas just spill out of their overheated brain. He's not an Einstein imagining himself writing on a beam of light and having a flash of insight that would become the theory of special relativity. He's not the young Sir Isaac Newton who cooped up at home for a couple of summers college being closed for the plague, invented calculus, optics, and the law of gravity just to kill some time. That is a true story, by the way. Isaac Newton redefined what it means to say, yeah, I had a pretty good year. <laughs> Darwin's genius was of a different sort. Darwin's genius was grounded in a passionate love of seeing, of carefully examining the natural world all around him. He was in love with the natural world. He took it in, he sketched it out in his notebooks, and then his genius was in the enormous patience with which he made his scientific case, with which he formulated ideas after he had begun to suspect what he had begun to suspect. He painstakingly accumulated data, corroborating evidence from many different scientific branches, zoology, geology, botany, paleontology, animal husbandry, and from the study of many diverse kinds of life. Beetles, turtles, the famous Galapagos finches, carrier pigeons, bivalves, orchids, primates. He built the case for his great idea from a mountain of evidence over decades, only finally taking his ideas to the public when it seemed like he was about to be scooped by someone else. And by then his work was unassailable. So Charles Darwin, of course, is the person credited with the discovery of evolution through natural selection. 
That is to say, he discovered that all present-day living things, you, me, algae, antelopes, orchids, badgers, mushrooms, mosquitoes, all of it can be traced back through time to a single common ancestor, which was basically a leaky bag of cell bits powered by light. And he discovered that all of this magnificent living variation sprang up through the process of natural selection, whereby small changes caused by random mutations accumulate over time as they prove beneficial to an organism's survival and reproduction, multiply those selected changes by billions of years, and you can go from single-celled organisms like bacterium to multi-celled organisms like Ryan Gosling. <laughs> and it was Darwin's genius to painstakingly accumulate this massive body of evidence to make his case to the scientific community. And today, 214 years after Darwin's birth, his vision of evolution is as much established fact as anything in science can be. And yet, and yet, the radical implications of his discovery and the spiritual implications of his discovery, we are still wrestling with because evolution calls us to rethink and reimagine our relationship to life on Earth. Before the theory of evolution, the fundamental story to experience, to, excuse me, to explain the appearance of diversity of life on Earth, at least in the West, which is where we are, the fundamental story was the book of Genesis in the Hebrew Bible, which is also the Christian Old Testament. The book of Genesis says, of course, that the universe, the earth, all life was created over the course of six days by God, and then to cap off this project, at the end of the sixth day, God created humans as a special act of creation, as the only object of creation made in the image of God. Then God put us in charge of everything that came before. In the story, we humans are granted dominion over the earth and its living beings. And evolution takes the idea of the special creation of human life, a life that is radically different from all other kinds of living beings, and it replaces it with the idea that all life, including our own, is the product of one continuously unfolding process set in motion ultimately by the birth of the universe. Right, evolution replaces the six days of the book of Genesis with 14 billion years give or take, 12 billion years from the Big Bang to make a Milky Way galaxy to shape and cool and properly water a nutrient-rich planet Earth, an unknown amount of time for some of those nutrients to spontaneously organize into replicating molecule chains, and then 2 billion years, give or take, for those replicating molecule chains to organize into living cells, and then for those living cells to diversify into all of the life we see around us. Charles Darwin surmised, and science tends to confirm his view, that all living things alive today are the common descendants of one ancestral organism. And from this single root grew the tangled tree of life as species branched off and branched off and branched off from their forebears, each finding their own unique way to make a successful living in the ecosystem. But popular depictions of evolution often greatly simplify this process to show a linear march of life forms through time, right? We've got the fish crawling out of the water, evolving into the reptile, then the mammal, then primates and humans. You've seen the posters. The arrangement visually suggests the process of replacement, of one thing turning into another, newer, better thing. It reads like a story of progress, with humans at the end of progress. And in this way, the emotional content of the old dominion idea of humanity's special specialness is preserved within the new framework of evolution. We think naturally in terms of lower and higher life forms, and we place ourselves at the top of this ladder of being. And so the question is sometimes asked, for example, honestly asked, thinking of life as a progression from worse to better, that if monkeys evolved into humans, why are monkeys still around? If the lower life forms evolved into higher life forms, then why weren't the lower life forms replaced by the newer, better thing? And this is a misunderstanding, right? Because monkeys did not evolve into humans, but rather monkeys and humans share a common ancestor. And what this means is at some point there was a species that was not a monkey and not a human, and some of its descendants settled on the monkey way of being in the world, which is awesome. And some of its descendants settled on the human way of being in the world, which is equally awesome. 
Evolution is not a linear progression. It is a branch giving rise to more branches, which give rise to more branches, which give rise to more branches. And then our human species then is like one tiny green shoot on one of millions of branches of the tree of life, each having come into existence in exactly the same way, each sharing the common trait of having found an awesome way of being in the world. How absurd then to circle this one tiny shoot on this enormous bristling plant of healthy, successful growths and say, well, this is clearly the reason the plant exists and all of the whole must exist to service this one little shoot. And so evolution has been called a second Copernican revolution. The first Copernican revolution said the earth and thus humankind is not at the center of the universe but lies in one corner of a spiraling galaxy amidst billions of galaxies. Evolution, the second Copernican revolution, says humankind is not at the center of the biosphere either. We are not a special act of creation. Made by God on the sixth day and given dominion over the earth, we are not above other living things. And in this way, evolution proposes a radical decentering of the human story and the overall story of life on earth. We are one species among millions, all created by the same unthinking process, neither more nor less likely, neither more nor less chosen, neither more nor less destined to a bright future. Evolution tells us in the words of UU Minister Forrest Church that we come from a common source and we share a common destiny. And what a common source it is. Born of ancient stars whose matter traversed billions of miles of space to shape our galaxy, our world ultimately become our very flesh and blood. Right? We have stardust in our bones and stardust in our veins, and our story is as old as the universe and inseparable from the universe. What mystery and magic and dignity there is in this story of life. Now, you can believe in evolution and believe in some concept of God or deity. Some 30% of Americans who believe in evolution also believe the process was somehow set in motion or inspired or guided by a divine being. Scientifically speaking, the theory of evolution does not require a helper God to work, but it is not incompatible with the existence of God. And what I would say to anyone who does believe that evolution is the means by which God created life, Consider then the story of evolution as an alternative creation text and ask, what is the meaning of this new story? Because it is a story which emphasizes our kinship, our interconnectedness, our interdependence with all other living things. It is not a story of dominion. And the dominion mythos, I believe, has been a ticking time bomb within our culture. So long as humans were limited in their capacity to materially affect their environment, this worldview might condone the local exploitation of animals, the local despoliation of the environment, but it could not break out to do global harm. But for the last several centuries, our astonishing increase in technological prowess has been harnessed to the engine of global capitalism to exert our dominion over the natural world to an unprecedented degree. And too late, we are discovering as climate change and species extinction spiral out of control that our pretense at dominion is an illusion. It always was. That we remain in the end utterly dependent on natural systems vastly greater than our ability to predict and control. And so we need a creation story that emphasizes our kinship with the web of life. We need a creation story that restores the dignity of the natural world and all of its living inhabitants. We need a creation story that brings us back into oneness with the processes that nurture and sustain us. And we need a creation story that reconnects us to the enchantment and awesomeness of the natural world. These creation stories exist in other cultures. Biologist Robin Wall Kimmerer, who is also a member of the Potawatomi Nation, writes in her book, Braiding Sweetgrass. In the Western tradition, she says, there is a recognized hierarchy of beings, with, of course, the human being on top, the pinnacle of evolution, the darling of creation. But in native ways of knowing, she says, human beings are often referred to as the younger brothers of creation. We say that humans have the least experience with how to live and thus the most to learn. 
She says we must look to our teachers among the other species for guidance. Their wisdom is apparent in the way they live. They teach us by example. And she concludes they've been on the earth far longer than we have been, and they've had time to figure things out. And so in a 2015 article called Nature Needs a New Pronoun, Robin Wall Kimmerer relates how Darwin's fundamental scientific discovery that all life is not just interrelated, but literally related, that all living things are kin, this insight is already embedded in the language of some native people. Kimmerer says that in her native language of Anishinaabe, which was erased from her family in the boarding schools and which she is relearning as an adult, in that language, it is impossible to speak of a living being as an it. In Anishinaabe and many other indigenous languages, she says, we use the same words to address all living things as we do our family, because they are our family. And imagine if embedded in our language itself was the idea that nature was our kin. How different would our world be? Would our oceans be dying? Would our forests be disappearing? Would the mass extinction of non-human species be an unrecognized, uncontested, unchallenged reality of the modern world as it in fact is today? How differently would we orient ourselves to the world if we saw it as our kin, which it is? Darwin wrote, there is grandeur in this view of life with its several powers having been originally breathed into a few forms or into one. From so simple a beginning, he said, endless forms, most beautiful and most wonderful, have been and are being evolved. There's grandeur in this view of life. It is the view of life to which our seventh Unitarian Universalist principle calls us, one rooted in the most profound respect for the great web of being, in profound gratitude to life and our relationship to it, and one which must call us to some grief for the ways in which we have dishonored that relationship, in which we have torn the fabric of the web. Written into each creature, howsoever humble, is the history of the universe. You, me, the squirrels chasing each other on the lawn, the insects churning the soil underneath, the birds serenading us from above. We are all part of the same ancient story of life unfolding since before even the stars lit the skies. And within us and through us all move the same creative force, bringing endless new forms of life into being. The same stream of life that runs through my veins night and day, says the poet, runs through the world and dances in rhythmic measures. So may we encounter this enchanted world and know its ancient beauty, feel our deep kinship with life teeming all around. Let us learn a new creation story, not a story of separation and domination, but a story of connection and care, a story of kinship. And may this new story be a story of renewal, a story of hope and a story of healing for a world that so needs healing. Blessed be and amen.